When I first saw Joker, it wasn't the powerhouse acting of Joaquin Phoenix or even Hilder's score that stood out to me most. Though I fully agree that both of these individuals deserve all of the awards they've been collecting over this award show season, I already knew that Joaquin Phoenix is a tremendous actor. Ultimately, what was most unexpected to me was how spot on the film was in its depiction of the many factors that can be involved in the road to violent criminality, including how it relates to certain types of mental illness and trauma. When discussing how Hollywood films depict mental illnesses, one can make the argument that it's just a work of fiction meant to captivate and entertain its audience, but the amount of misinformation that Hollywood films spread about mental health, looking at you, Silver Linings Playbook, speaks to an epidemic of ignorance on the subject matter. Love is not a magical band-aid to fix severe mental disorders. Mental health is so much more than people feeling sad. A lack of knowledge and resources for vulnerable, at-risk individuals can quite literally be the difference between life and death. The ultimate dumpster fire of a television series, 13 Reasons Why, was found to be correlated with an increase in youths taking their own lives since, and regardless of the blatant lies from Netflix's PR department, the show did not actually follow the advice of mental health professionals when creating it. They showed a graphic depiction of Hannah Baker taking her own life that they've now removed from the episode only because of the bad publicity they got. And they also had a character approach a school shooter to try to talk them down, which a professional said on the show's very own after show, you should never ever do that. There has been a lot of backlash against Joker where people claim that the film is romanticizing white male violence, no, it's not. That is a reductive oversimplification of the material, and perhaps if you were not the type of person to idealize films watered down to pander to children, or had any true academic understanding of how incredibly complex and multifaceted the trajectory of a person becoming a violent criminal is, you would not be saying such foolish things in the first place. If it wasn't obvious already, this discussion will have spoilers, but judging by the film's global box office and the fact that you clicked on this video, it's safe to assume that you've probably already seen it. If you've never heard of the expression, correlation does not imply causality, I will explain it since it's relevant to the subject matter addressed in Joker, as well as many research studies on matters regarding mental health. If psychologists research poverty and violent criminality, let's just pose the hypothetical that they've used a sample of violent offenders and found a statistically significant amount of them grew up in poverty. However, if the researchers cannot prove a cause and effect relationship between those two things, the researchers can only report a correlation and not a causality. The countless hours of research that psychologists have done into the various factors that are correlated with things like violent criminality or taking your own life and so on and so forth are crucial because they help people to determine the best ways to enact meaningful changes that can lessen the likelihood of these things happening. These can include pushing for things like making counseling and medication more accessible, or addressing the socioeconomic inequality that is deeply intertwined with harm to people's physical and mental well-being. So in the case of Joker, when they're showing various factors that have played a part in his downward spiral, including physical abuse as a child, the mental illness of his mother, his poverty, or stopping his medication. It's not saying that any of these factors are automatic causes of violent crimes in just anyone and everyone, nor are those factors intended to be an excuse or justification of his actions. No one should be surprised that a story like the one in Todd Phillips' Joker has captivated such a massive audience. People have always been curious about what criminals do and why they do it. On top of of the many scientific studies conducted on the brains, backgrounds, and behavior of violent offenders, 
True crime is a massive genre of content across many platforms, be it YouTube videos, podcasts, or documentaries. The interest in this subject matter does not mean that all of these people are romanticizing criminals or their actions. In the most extreme cases, yes, you can find people who take it to that level, but for many, it's a mere curiosity about understanding why these things happen. There is a separate point to be made about how racial biases manifest in the reporting by the media on violent criminals, and the way white offenders are frequently reported to have been mentally ill while non-white offenders are demonized by the media and the law without consideration of their mental state. That is absolutely a conversation worth having, but as this story is focusing on one specific criminal who happens to be white, I would note that the story is not doing that problem problematic thing of demonizing people of color who are also charged with the same crimes as their white counterparts. Works of fiction do not exist in a vacuum. We are all going to bring our perspectives, and oftentimes the socio-political baggage that weighs most heavily on our minds, to our viewing and consuming of works of fiction. However, anyone claiming or even insinuating that Joker is perpetuating those racist biases against people of color color are simply not correct. There are certain mental illnesses that you are more likely to find in various categories of violent offenders, but the broad term of mental illness is not a homogenous entity. Mental illness should not be demonized because not all mental illnesses are the same. There are plenty of mentally ill individuals who never commit violent crimes, and there are some violent criminals who happen to suffer from mental illnesses. The lack of knowledge and accurate information regarding these conditions being circulated around both in works of fiction and in the news, as well as the issues that surround these conditions are far bigger than one film about Arthur Fleck. Now let's get on to the specifics of his story. If you've watched my other video essays, you probably don't need me to explain nature versus nurture, but for those of you that are new to my channel, I will briefly explain it once again. Nature versus nurture refers to the question of whether a person's personality and behavior comes from their genetics or their experiences, and the research has overall shown that it's a combination of the two. Arthur has two possible scenarios of his origins, since he learns at Arkham that his mother adopted him as a baby, but his mother claims that Thomas Wayne used his money and power to fabricate the adoption paper trail because he illegitimately fathered a child outside of his marriage. Either way, Arthur becomes an at-risk individual since on the one hand he may have inherited his mother's struggles with mental health, but he also suffers significant trauma both physically and psychologically because of her violent boyfriend and her negligence. Many studies have been done on the effects of head trauma on human behavior, dating back as far as a landmark case by J. M. Harlow in 1868, to try to condense the findings across numerous academic articles and research papers, I will simply state that damage to the prefrontal cortex of the brain can oftentimes lead to an increase in aggressive and or violent behavior. Obviously, Arthur Fleck does not have a point in the story where he gets his brain scanned for the sake of us studying the neuroimaging, but it is a logical conclusion to come to that his head injury is an important factor in his behavior as an adult, whether it's the arrested development, the laughing condition, or the eventual violence. One of the film's many brilliant choices is the ambiguity regarding his origins. Arthur doesn't know if his mother adopted him or if Thomas Wayne did indeed forge that paper trail, and neither do we. We can certainly guess and form theories, but the film never gives us a very clear answer. 
It creates an uneasy feeling and it makes for a more immersive viewing experience. Anyone that's ever been gaslit is probably going to have a strong reaction to seeing that same thing happen to the main character of a story. For example, if you don't think I was fully prepared to fly through my screen and lay a smackdown on Christian in Midsummer almost every time he opened his mouth, then you just don't know me at all. The city has cut funding across the board. Social services is part of that. This is the last time we'll be meeting. It's really peculiar how so many people are circulating the narrative that Joker is about white male rage when Arthur Fleck does not express sentiments that fixate on the fact that he is white or anything to do with negative stereotypes towards other ethnicities. He's instead shown to be consistently reactionary in his anger within his most immediate surroundings. Yuppies on the train harassing him? Pop, pop, pop. Friend from work tried to implicate him to the police? Smash. Mom lied to him for his whole life? Good night. Reactive aggression is something that research has shown to be more common among maltreated children than those who are not maltreated, so this is another accurate depiction in the film. Since we see the backstory of what his mother and her boyfriend did to him as a child. Another key point to note in the sequence of events of Joker's story is that Arthur's delusions coincide more or less after the funding is cut for the services he was receiving which included counseling and medication. He has an encounter with his neighbor, and this time she tells him one of the things that he's always wanted to hear, that he's funny. Keep in mind that the only other encounter he has had with her before this is one where she was not particularly interested in or amused by his behavior. So we've established the cut funding for mental health resources and the lack of empathy the wealthy elite have for the poor. This is notable not only in the yuppies harassing Arthur on the train, but the late night host Murray Franklin and his audience making jokes at Arthur's expense, and of course, Thomas Wayne. On a side note, I want to point out that I've heard some complaints about how Thomas Wayne was such a good man who would never do what he did in this film. This film is only loosely inspired by the comics. Todd Phillips has never once said that this story is supposed to be comic accurate. So if that's your gripe with the film, you are really grasping at straws. Circling back to the matter of socioeconomic inequality, this is really a key point at the very center of the film. Because the story does not only look at Arthur Fleck's intimate thoughts and feelings and the various traumas he has experienced both physically and psychologically, the story also addresses the very real threat that socioeconomic inequality poses to the well-being of those at the very bottom of that hierarchy. Joker is a film that is just as much about the violence inflicted on Arthur Fleck as it is about the violence he inflicts on others, neither of which is supposed to be seen as okay. Context is not a justification for harming others, it's simply the ugly reality of how often hurt people go on to hurt more people. The layers of the story that address socioeconomic inequality are a way of panning out from the focus on this one single character and shining a light on the larger, more insidious forces at work that can act as a puppeteer of sorts, pulling on the strings of people's lives. These topics that are addressed in Joker are really dense, and there's so much research that could be explored in depth and applied bit by bit to various scenes and lines, but I will just leave you with this quote from a paper by Bufkin and Luttrell that conducted neuroimaging studies of violent and aggressive behavior. According to the works in our review, as well as other research in this area, all forms of child abuse and neglect, direct exposure to violence, including media violence, an unstable family life, poor parenting, lack of prenatal and perinatal services, individual drug use, maternal drug use during pregnancy, poor educational and employment structures, poverty, and even exposure to racism play a vital role in the production of aggression and or violence. Evidence suggests that these conditions operate on and through the body, 
to increase the probability of an aggressive and or violent response and that the most effective way to control this behavior is to proactively arrest they're using the word arrest to mean stop institutional and relational deprivations that place some individuals at a higher risk hi everyone it's lady genevieve thank you so much for watching my very very rushed video review of joker bit of a video essay bit of a review i really wanted to make a video that would make note of the various ways that i found the film to be very effective as far as the subject matter goes i don't always take a really academic approach to making video essays but in this case this was something that stood out a lot to me when i was watching the film for the first time so it felt like a natural progression when trying to brainstorm how i would talk about it for the sake of a youtube video if you enjoyed it please consider giving it a like and comment down below how excited you are about joaquin and hildor sweeping this award show season or if you're not excited I guess you can complain about it. I mean, it's definitely a productive use of your time here on YouTube. If you are new to my channel, I will put some of my other reviews in the description box and I will also more specifically single out the ones that are about DC films and put those in the pinned comment section if you would like to check them out. If you are one of my regular viewers, then you know that I have been posting a fair bit of press content to do with music interviews. Those are coming from a seasonal event and will not be the main focus of this channel. I am very much invested in doing more of my film and TV reviews. If you have any other films that you would like for me to make videos on, let me know. I had not even planned to make a video on cats, but then one of my viewers wrote to me suggesting that I do that. And initially I had thought, well, no, everyone has already talked about it. What else is there for me to say on it? But then the more I thought about it, I went, no, I can talk about that. And it turned out that a fair few people have watched that video now. Subscribe so you can be notified when I post more film reviews. And feel free to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and Vero to get even more of my running commentary on the various works of fiction that I am consuming. See you in the next one. Bye. You're welcome.